Hi everyone, welcome back. In this section we're going to look at how to use double integrals to determine the surface area of a surface in three dimensions. Let's just remind ourselves that in Calculus 2, in Math 152, we did work out the surface area of a surface, but in that case it was a surface of revolution. So if we were rotating a curve y equals f of x about the x-axis, then we had this integral formula for the corresponding surface area. So here was the picture we had. Maybe we had some curve that looked like this between some values a and b. And then we were to revolve it around the x-axis. And that would produce a surface of revolution. And then we had a, this integral formula that's presented here as the formula for the surface area. Now how did we get that? The idea was we chopped up our, 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 our curve into a bunch of little segments and then we looked at what each of those segments made in terms of a surface and found the surface area of that and then summed over them all and uh, let the number of slices go off to infinity or the thickness of the slices go to zero and that turned it into an integral. Let's just unpack that a little bit. So I just want to justify where this integral formula came from. So if we look at a little segment of our curve, when we revolve it around the axes, what that does is it traces out a frustum of a cone. something like this. And so there's our corresponding little surface. And so the idea was if we took a little segment of our curve, a segment of length delta little s, for our change in our arc length here, then we produced a surface area of capital delta s. So that's our surface area of this little piece. And then we summed over all of these. So what is the area of this slice, this area of this surface, delta capital S? Well, this is a portion of a cone, or what we call a frustum of a cone. And so let's recall what the surface area of this is. So the idea that we're using here, or that we did use in Calculus 2, is we had a cone with its tip cut off, essentially. We have a base radius of B. We have a top radius of A. And then we have this side length L. And this frustum of a cone has surface area given by 2 pi, the average rate times the average radius a plus b over 2 times the length of the side L. And so that was a formula. We derived it in, in Calculus 2. Um, I'm not going to derive it here. You could derive it on your own. If you uh, don't know this formula, if you don't recall this formula, you can certainly derive it on your own. The idea is, well, work it out when a is 0, so when you just got a cone itself. And if you cut along this cone and unroll it, then you actually get a portion of a circle. And you can work out the area of the portion of that circle, just using your area of a circle formula. So anyways, that's our area of our portion of our cone. So in this case, the one up above, we have to think about, okay, what is our base radius? What is our, our tip radius? And our base radius is going to be that distance there, whereas our tip radius is going to be this distance here. And this is a result of chopping it up into a bunch of little bits. So this would be, for example, position xi, and this would be position 
fxi minus 1. So this would be height fxi, and this would be height fxi minus 1. So then our area of that portion of a cone would be 2 pi f of xi minus 1 plus f of xi all over 2. I'm just using the formula down below that I wrote in the recall box, times the side length, and that side length is delta s, the arc length parameter here. So the main thing to keep in mind is this is a big s here, big s for surface area. Maybe I'll put a little head on that s there. And this is a little s on the right. That's the s for the arc length. And this fxi minus 1 fxi uh, plus fxi over 2, that's just the average height of the function over that tiny little segment. So that's basically just some fxi star for some sample point in the interval. And so this is that little bite-sized surface area, that, that slice that we've got here drawn, that's the, the, air, the surface area that's sliced. Then we want to integrate over all of these things, or sum over all of them, and then look at the limit as the thickness goes to zero, and that gives us the integral. And so what we're doing is we're integrating over an expression like this, which means that our surface area of the corresponding surface of revolution is the integral of 2 pi times the function f ds. So that's what we get from here. We get up to that expression. And then to finish it off, we say, oh, but ds, that's the arc length differential. And the arc length differential is this expression here, square root of 1 plus the derivative squared times dx. And so that was our way of proving this formula for the surface area of a surface of revolution in calculus 2. What we're going to do in this section is we're going to generalize the surface area formula for any surface in uh, three dimensions. And we will see how we can prove the surface area formula in terms of a double integral without using this idea of going to uh, cones and cutting them up and using some uh, surface area formulas for these basic objects. Instead, we will look at planes and parallelograms and finding the surface area of those using techniques from vector algebra that we developed earlier in the course. So let's go ahead and see what we can do for general surfaces. So here's the idea. We've got this surface drawn below. That's our orange surface. And we'd like to figure out what its surface area is. So we do the normal thing. Chop up the domain into a bunch of little rectangles. Over each little rectangle, we go up and look at the surface. That's some little tiny patch of the surface. We try to get an estimate for what is the surface area, that little patch. We sum over all the patches and then we let the dimensions of the little rectangles down below go to zero, and that turns it into an integral. So the whole idea is then to figure out what is the area of a tiny little patch on the surface above this rectangle r, i, j. So what we'll do is we'll let delta s, i, j, that's a capital S again, that is going to be the area of a patch on the surface above rij, the rectangle rij. And that's going to be approximately equal to what we call delta tij, which is the area of the patch on the tangent plane to the surface above that rectangle Rij. And that's this green patch that's drawn in our figure. That's the tangent plane above the rectangle Rij down below. And we'd like to figure out what is the area of this patch of the tangent plane. So we want to find 
an expression for delta Tij, the area of that patch of the tangent plane. So in the next diagram, we just have the tangent plane drawn. And the idea is to figure out what its area is, I just need to know two vectors. I need to know the vector a and the vector b. But the vector a, that is just the tangent vector in the plane tij in the i hat direction. So in other words, it's just the tangent vector to the, sur to the surface at xi, yj in the i hat direction. And we know what that tangent vector is. It's 1, 0, and then the x derivative at xi, yj. And in particular, we want to scale it so that it has the right length. So this is delta x down here, so we just want to make sure that our vector is scaled to the right length so that it's also got a length of delta x in the x direction. We're going to do the same thing for that vector b. That's the tangent vector in the tangent plane in the j direction now, or j hat direction. So that would be delta y, 0, 1, and then the y derivative of xi, yj. Now I've got those two vectors, I can figure out what the area is. The area of Tij is just the magnitude of the cross product of these two vectors. And what is the magnitude of the cross product? Well, it's ij hat k hat. So this is the cross product. I can scale out the delta x and the delta y. I'll bring those all the way out, delta x, delta y. There's a magnitude going on here, so I'll just keep the magnitudes around everything. The other set of vertical bars represents the determinant of this 3x3 three three matrix I use for getting the cross product. The vectors in the cross product are 1, 0, f sub x, 0, 1, f sub y. And so this becomes then the magnitude of the cross product. The cross product is negative f sub x negative f sub y and 1. And then we still have a delta x delta y hanging on on the end. And the length of this vector is the sum of the squares of the entries. So it's 1 plus f sub x squared plus f sub y squared square rooted delta x delta y. So that is our estimate for the area of the little patch above rectangle Rij. And if I sum over all of these things and look at the delta x and delta y is going to zero, then what it does is it converts it to an integral over the whole region of this square root function of one plus the partial derivative squared with respect to x plus the f sub y squared. And so that proves our result stated right back here that says the surface area is given by this double integral. We are integrating the square root of 1 plus f sub x squared plus f sub y squared. So now we can go ahead and use this result to figure out some surface areas. Let's go ahead and do an example. Let's find the surface area of the part of the surface z equals xy that lies within the cylinder x squared plus y squared equals 1. So I've got the surface drawn there. We can go ahead and look at the region in the plane that we are wanting to integrate over. That's going to be a circle of radius 1. So it's 1 and that's 1. So there's the region we are integrating over. The things we need in order to put this integral together is we need to know the x derivative. And so in this case I'm thinking of the function f sub x y as just that product x times y, because that's giving our surface, z is equal to x times y. So f sub x is y, f sub y is x. So the surface area, which we denote by that capital S, is the integral over this region D, which I'll label over here, D for disk, it's a circular disk. And we are integrating 
1 plus f sub x squared plus f sub y squared and then dA. Now we've got our integral all set up. In fact I can go even one step further. I could say it's okay. It's the integral over the disk of the square root of 1 plus x squared plus y squared. Okay, I did reverse the order of f sub x and f sub y as they were written in the line above. f sub x is y, so it should be y squared plus s squared, but I just switched the order. The sum is commutative, so I can switch the order, and I've written it this way to maybe conjure up some images of, oh, there's an x squared plus y squared there. Oh, and we're using a circular disk. Maybe this means that polar coordinates should be our choice of coordinate systems. So maybe we should change to polar coordinates. If we do that, then the region we're integrating over is going to go from 0 to 1 for r, and theta is going to go from 0 to 2 pi. So when I make this change to polar coordinates, I can go r from 0 to 1, theta from 0 to 2 pi. The integrand becomes square root of 1 plus r squared. dA becomes r dr d theta. And that's nice because well, maybe I can do the outer integral even first. Um, there's no theta in our integrand, so the outer integral, 0 to 2 pi of something that's constant relative to theta, just becomes 2 pi. The inner integral is 0 to 1, r square root of 1 plus r squared dr. That integral, we get a 1 plus r squared to the 3 halves. And let's just see what, so we can do a substitution here, and that's effectively what I'm doing. Now I'm just trying to figure out what that uh, number has to be out front in order for the derivative of this to give me the integrand in the line before. So when I differentiate this, I get a 3 halves coming down, so I need a 2 thirds to cancel it off. So that 3 halves comes down, cancels with the 2 thirds. Then I reduce the exponent to a half, good, because there's a square root in the integrand. And then I have a 2r coming out from the chain rule, and I'm not allowed to have that 2 in front because I don't have an extra 2 in front, so I'm going to have to actually divide by 2 again, so I'll throw another 2 down below, and there we go. We've got something who's got the right antiderivative, and so now we can clean it up a little bit. So I get a 2 pi by 3, and then the 1 goes in, and that gives me a 2 to the 3 halves, and then minus the 0 goes in, and that's a 1 to the 3 halves. And so there is our final result for our surface area of that surface. Alright, so I'll stop this first part of the video here. Um, next is just two more examples, so I'll break them up into two more videos, two short videos that you can watch in either order. Alright, so we'll see you in the next video.